Hello and welcome back to LG Custom Lures and today I'm going to be bringing you along with me as I make this versatile two-piece bluegill glide bait out of this block of poplar wood. I sketched out this bluegill glide bait profile on this thin transparent vellum sheet and I transferred this sketch to my block of wood. This sheet allows me to transfer carving details to the lure as needed, so I set this aside for later. I then cut this sketched profile out on my bandsaw. I try to stay away from the line with my cut as I can follow the lines more accurately by sanding to it afterwards with the bench sander. I drill an alignment hole through the bait where the eyes will be, and then I transfer the bait's top and bottom profile to the block of wood. This bait will get a molded soft plastic tail, so I make sure to leave enough material to cut the tail slot in later. Since I am not removing a ton of wood, I am just carving this profiling on the bench sander. This is quite dusty and less precise than carving with a chisel or a knife so I try to avoid this where possible. You must be very careful and go very slowly when using this tool to carve as it removes a lot of material very quickly and it can easily send you back to step one if you're caught not paying attention. Then I cut the tail slot out on the bandsaw. I forgot to support the workpiece from the bottom so this cut is very sketchy. While it may be a bit of do as I say and not as I do, please do not make cuts like this at home and next time I will be sure to properly support the workpiece. After all, it's not worth losing any digits over. I use my nail and vellum trick to align my sketch on both sides of the bait to transfer the gill details. This method really works well in addressing one of the biggest challenges in bait making, mirroring your carvings on both sides of the bait. It is difficult enough to carve these details in once, but it's very tricky to mirror both sides exactly the same. This trick at the very least gives you an accurate reference of where the carvings need to be to begin with. I drill out the eye sockets with a half inch Forstner bit, and then I begin to carve the gill details by just scoring the wood along the sketched lines. It's quite helpful to have a very sharp utility knife for this. I sketch in chamfer lines for reference with carving the body of the bait, and I begin slicing away at the wood, keeping in mind the direction of the wood grain to prevent tear out. This is quite a meditative process, and it's very easy to get lost in the work. I start carving the gill details by shaving away the wood behind the scored lines. You can see the detail carvings emerging from the wood as I carve away the material up to these lines. Once the body of the bait is roughly shaped and the gill details carved, it's time to sand it smooth. Here we aren't sanding up to 400 plus grit for a smooth finish, we are simply shaping the sharp edges where I have carved to create a more smooth and organic shape.
I mark where to cut the joint in on this bait and it's off to the bandsaw to cut along the line. I saw this boat in half! Now that's a lot of damage! I then relieve both sides of the joint evenly to create the desired range of motion. As a general rule of thumb, the more range of motion in your glide bait's joint, the tighter the glide action, and conversely, the tighter the joint range of motion, the wider the glide action. For this bait, I'm going for more of a quick twitching action and less of a wide glide, so I'm aiming for more range of motion. I twist up some stainless wire into some hardware for the bait, one line tie, two hook hangers, and two loops for the joint. I drill out the holes for this hardware with a drill bit and begin to carve out the pockets for the joint. For this I use a burr bit in my Dremel and just go slowly checking the depth on the hinge every so often. One of my top goals with this type of joint is always to avoid wood on metal contact as that will wear away the wood quickly and create holes where the water can seep into the wood and damage the integrity of the joint. I drill out the pin location for the joint hinge with a drill bit before finishing drilling out the hole with the actual wire I used to pin the joint. This makes for a snug fit since I don't have a drill bit that's the exact size for this wire. I also drill out the holes for the tail fin pins that will hold in the soft plastic tail. It's time to glue up the hardware. For this bait I used a thick super glue and I had great success. I've used super glue in the past with varying levels of success, but I'm happy with how it worked out on this particular bait. It's time to ballast this lure. I marked out where the lead holes should go along the bottom of the bait before grabbing my quarter inch Forstner bit and boring these holes out. I fit the quarter inch solid core lead wire into the hole and I cut it to size. This is just an estimate at this point. I'm not expecting to guess correctly and have a perfect bait right away. I simply have to create a solid starting point for my tuning process. I then bathe the lure in super glue to seal up the wood grain and strengthen the wood. It's very important that you use thin super glue for this so that it can soak into the wood. Since I am using glass eyes on this bait, I need to account for the weight of the eyes. I weigh out a small piece of lead and I tape it to the eye socket to get the most accurate weight distribution for my test. Speaking of the test, this is the last bait that I tune in the sink, I promise. Towards the end of this video, you will see my new solution for bait tuning, and I think you're going to like it. Remember when tuning a two-piece glide bait to not only get an even sink when assembled, but also for each of the two pieces individually. Also remember that your final product will sink faster than this test as you will be adding more weight that is unaccounted for in the form of paint and clear coat layers. My goal for this bait was to achieve three different sink rates with three different sizes of hooks. From a near suspend to a medium sink rate, I needed to get this bait's ballast extremely stable so that the different weights of the hooks wouldn't throw off the action.
Once I had the ballast right where I wanted it on this bait, I sealed up the lead holes with the old super glue and baking soda trick. And now it's time to get the bait's surface ready for paint. This of course involves sanding the surface smooth, but also filing any imperfections like this one in the tail from the drill chuck when I drilled out the holes for the tail fin pins. This is a difficult part of bait making because sanding is no fun, but it's super important and I believe the amount of effort here is truly reflected in the final product. For this bait, I am using a rattle can primer. This primer is designed for automotive applications, however, it lays on very well and has great adhesion to the sealed wood surface. When laying the primer down, the bait becomes very monotone and you really get a sense of the effort that you put in with the prior step. All the surface blemishes become very noticeable, and this is a great moment to address any of these as necessary before continuing. I have experimented with sanding this primer before and I like the end result. I get a much more vibrant paint job with just a little bit of sanding, and as long as you clean up and prep the surface after sanding, I've had no impacts with my paint layer adhesion. Let's be real, this is a dusty multi-purpose shop and by no means it's a surgical environment suitable for high quality paintwork. However, when busting out the paint booth, I try to take every step available to myself to minimize dust. A good vacuum job and a quick water spritz with the squirt bottle goes a long way. I start my paint layers off with a mixed off-white base coat. I debated leaving this in the video or cutting it out, but, but I was really having trouble with how this first layer was spraying. The paint was not atomizing properly and the end result was sloppy, so I stripped it off. Mistakes like these are frustrating and annoying, but they are part of the bait making process. To be honest, I'm not really sure what happened here. I suspect it was old paint or a sloppy job cleaning the airbrush, but either way, I'll just have to chalk it up to lessons learned. Then I began forming the natural light to dark transition by hitting the belly of the bait with some yellow ochre and the top with some gray. I then spray some burnt umber through some stenciling fabric to make a blotchy orange belly of the bluegill. I use the same fabric to stencil some blotchy dark green and brown spots on the back of the bluegill. I've learned in my experience painting lures that generally the more layers of blotchy colors make a more natural looking paint job. Though this is especially true when painting fish less uniform and more colorful such as the bluegill. Because I painted gray just above the first layer on the back, when I come back over the gray with the yellow ochre, the two colors mix and create a great natural looking olive color. I add a bit more green and gold to this paint to give it more depth. I then cut a stencil for the classic bluegill bar pattern using my favorite vellum drafting sheet material. This stuff works great for stencils as well because moisture from the paints does not affect the material so it lasts a long time. It's also plenty flexible to form around the contours of the bait while being supple enough to not damage the fresh and still soft paint layers underneath. I spray platinum colored paint through some window screen mesh for some scales, and this thing is starting to really come to life.
I just need to add a few little details, such as the blotchy blue on the gills. And the black dot trailing the gill plate. Along with a little bit of eye socket shading and we are good to go. I mix up some epoxy resin to secure these heavy glass eyes to the bait. It's now time to mix the epoxy clear coat. This is not a relaxing part of the bait making process as it is mission critical to get right. This coat is self-leveling, but heat tends to help it along, and concentrated heat from a torch helps pop any bubbles that end up in the coat. Though it can be easy to burn the epoxy, so be careful. There is such thing as too much heat. It is so rewarding seeing all the layers of paint and detail shining under the high gloss coat. Once the clear coat cures into a hard protective outer layer, I do a final assembly of the different parts of the bait. Remember earlier in the video when I promised a new solution for bait tuning? Well, here it is, my new test tank. Here are the three different hook sizes and their varying sink rates on this bait. I like the slow to medium myself, but let me know what you think in the comments below. Folks, I have some totally unique and completely custom lures in the works, and I'm really excited to bring these projects to you. You're not going to want to miss them, so be sure you are subscribed to my channel. I will see you on the next project.